All righty. Um, starting at the outer surface, we see the smooth muscle myoid cells. We see some of those elongated nuclei of the spindle-shaped cells. They're the ones that we talk about are going to contract this, producing fluid pressures to help to propel the sperm. Remember also, the development of the sperm go from the basal surface of the tubule towards the lumen. And notice also that the largest cells aren't the ones at the border. Remember these cells at the border, notice some of them can be large, but remember these are our stem cells. These are our spermatogonium. No, uh, you should do the histology because it is important, but I'm not giving you extra credit for doing the histology for this one. Again, at some point, your grades do have to be based on what you guys actually do, so I can't just keep throwing around uh, extra credit. I wanted to do that there, but this is more just for educational purposes to help you to be successful on the exam. Remember, these cells at the surface are the basal cells, and, uh, the, and these basal cells are the stem cells, the spermatogonium. And as spermatogonium, their job is to divide rapidly. So occasionally you see a large cell because it is just about to get ready to divide or even in the process of dividing. But typically this outer surface cells are smaller because typically they are more constantly dividing. Where you typically see the largest cells, and notice also they have the most amount of DNA in them, are those primary spermatocytes. The primary spermatocytes are the cells that are the largest typically in our seminiferous tubule because they're the ones that still are uh, haploid. They're 2 and R, in fact, at this point because they are getting ready to divide because when they divide, they're going to split their material into two smaller secondary spermatocytes. And then, of course, those secondary spermatocytes divide into the much smaller um, uh, early spermatids, right? The sperm shape, uh, pardon me, the cell shape of spermatids, which are the early spermatids. So we can see that change in size and change in location as they work their way through the lumen. And we can see that in lots of examples here. Notice the nice one about this one is we're also starting to see some late spermatids where we can actually start to see the flagellum coming out of them. The heads are starting to elongate so we can see head formation and tail formation that is occurring here. However, what, uh, and again, we can see those clearly see the stem cells at the border where the myoid stem cells are, uh, and then the much larger uh, primary spermatocytes into smaller secondary spermatocytes into the early spermatids and then the late spermatids. But the reason I put this slide here that I like it a lot is because remember the other thing that is in here besides developing sperm are these cells here. And these cells here are the nurse cells. Notice again, as we talked about, they have elongated, sometimes triangular, sometimes diamond shaped. So they're these distinct elongated nuclei. Uh, these are those, again, nurse cells, Sertoli cells, or sustentacular cells. All of those are acceptable terms for uh, these cells that we see very nicely and very clearly on this one here. And then of course, again, we see the division. Notice this one doesn't show the myoid cells quite as nicely, uh, but this particular stain really does a nice job of showing those flagella of these uh, late spermatids as they're working their way towards the lumen. And so I thought this was a really nice view as well. And again, we can still see, again, find the basal surface. That is where you're gonna find the spermatogonium. The large cells that are just in from those are the primary spermatocytes. I would say it's probably hard to distinguish what's secondary and what's early spermatid in this particular view, which is why I didn't start with it. Uh, but this particular stain, I think, does a really nice job of showing those organelles that are the flagellum. And the other reason I showed this is because one of the two tissue types that in males you will get confused between is going to be the epididymis and the uh, seminiferous tubule. And again, some of that is fair because they both contain sperm inside of them. However, the difference is in our seminiferous tubules, we are forming the sperm. So notice we see flagellum deep within the tubules. We also see lots of nuclei very close to the lumen. And those are the two characteristics that our epididymis is not going to share, uh, which is what is going to allow us to be able to distinguish those when we look at those histologically. Again, here we have sperm, pretty simple and straightforward, basic anatomy to them. They have three main regions, 
the head, or like we talked about, that is the, uh, you know, contains the nucleus. Uh, we have the uh, body where we have the, or the, 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 the mid region, which contains the motor portion of it, the mitochondria. And then we have the flagellum, uh, the tail portion of that as well. The one thing I do want to point out is notice that all of the heads of these are light in color. Again, uh, the reason for that, remember, is that on the apical surface of the head, of the genetic region, we have that acrosomial cap. That is that specialized structure that contains those digestive enzymes, which as we'll learn is going to be what helps to allow them to be able to break through those defenses of the egg and fertilize the uh, the egg. So we have that on the head region as well. So typically you see this two-tone to it because the, we have this lighter region that tends to be associated with those uh, acrosomial caps that contain those uh, hydrolytic enzymes. The last little bit for our humans, uh, for our males, uh, for uh, is the um, penis. This is not a human penis, which is where I was going with that. Um, we have though, as we know, three regions of erectile tissue. We have two, and conveniently this picture had labels on it, so it was just super easy to be able to grab it. We have the two capora cavernosa, uh, and we have the corpus spongiosum. Remember, the corpus spongiosum wraps around a structure that should look fairly familiar because we saw it in the last section, and that is the urethra. Of course, this is the cavernous or penile or spongy urethra because it is contained within the penis. Uh, of course, we know it is lined with a transitional epithelial tissue, except at the very distal tip. At the very distal tip, it is lined with a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue because like most of our mucous membranes that are open to the outside world, we need that protection. So again, if you think of the anus, if you think of the vaginal canal, which we haven't talked about yet, but we will, if you talk about the end of the penis, uh, the end of the urethra, the oral cavity, all of those are lined with that non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue. But at this point, this would still be transitional. Remember the other thing that we said is that while the erectile tissue will engorge with blood and make the penis larger, it won't in and of itself make it rigid unless it has a fibrous protective sheath around it basically to restrict it and form that, that rigidity, make it turgid. And that is this structure here. This structure here, which notice also separates the two capora cavernosus from each other, is that collagen-rich layer known as the tunica albigenia. Again, this tunica albigenia is like a sheath around the, uh, uh, around the erectile tissue so that as it engorges, it pushes against its boundary, and that is where the rigidity comes from. We see a couple different examples of this. Here's another one. Uh, again, uh, none of these are human examples that we are looking at here. Um, but again, we have the urethra. We have the corpus spongiosum around him. Here we have the capora cavernosum. And notice it's not as distinctly separated. Uh, this looks like a rat or mouse uh, corpus cavernosum. But again, we still have that tunica albigenia that wraps around it. So we can see that distinct layer there as well. And then I think I have one more. Uh, two more, I lied. Um, this one, uh, again, really nice. These are not my arrows. This is just, these are pictures that I quickly grabbed off the inter interweb. Again, we have the urethra. I believe this one may be human based on the size of the urethra. Uh, but the other thing that I wanted to show you is we have these uh, eye-looking structures at the center of the corpus spongiosum. Anybody remember what those are called? Deep artery. Yeah, the deep artery, absolutely. It is that deep artery or central artery. Both of those are acceptable terms. Exactly. And this is the one that, as we talked about, uh, is the one that dilates, is the one that is controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system to bring engorgement to this area, blood to this area. And again, a nice distinct uh, tunica albigenia to this as well. One last one I found because it made me giggle uh, here. You can see again, they have a penis, we have these areas, and because of the vascularization of it, because of it, they thought it looked like a bear and put bears on it. Like I said, it made me laugh. It won't be on your exam, but it, I found it humorous. But it shows all of those structures that we need. The last thing for the male, as I mentioned, is the epididymis. 
uh, four, at least I think that's the last thing that we're responsible for. I, I cheat, I'll be dishonest, I stopped looking at the list. Uh, yeah, epididymis, perfect. Remember, as I said, this is probably the trickiest part of this histologically, right? Because if you just quickly glance at this, you may think that this, this is a testis, I mean a testis again, this might be seminiferous tubules. Especially when you see these things uh, that look like flagellum. But remember, they're not flagellum. This is a very special type of tissue found in this place and this place only. And this tissue is a pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue. But remember, what's special about it is that the cilia are non motile. So we've seen ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissues before, but this is the first one we've seen where these are not motile. It would almost make sense for them to be motile. It would help to move the sperm through them because uh, we know we don't want the sperm swimming, but my guess is that the speed of these flagellums, I mean, uh, the speed of the cilia would be too fast, probably, because remember, our sperm has to stay in here for 20 days. So they do a really nice job of increasing the surface area for all of the fluid so that the sperm can come in contact with them. So again, we can find abnormal ones and destroy them. But it can be tricky. There's really two ways to really tell, well, three, I guess, one, notice before when we saw all those distinct flagellum, we saw them coming from inside of the seminiferous tubules. Well, clearly all the cilia are just on the apical surface. Notice it is a pseudostratified, so it does appear to have multiple layers of uh, nuclei. Again, remember these aren't multiple layers of cells, they're just irregular shaped cells, so they appear to be layered. But notice, as I mentioned, there are really no nuclei in here. Whereas if you think about it, the number of nuclei in the seminiferous tube, you'll get more because you start with one stem cell and one primary, and then you get two secondary and you get four spermatids. So you actually see an increase in the number of cells in the seminiferous tubule, was clearly there is almost none here. The third way that you can kind of tell the epididymis from the seminiferous tubule is a complete artifact, right? And again, remember an artifact is something that is not present inside of a uh, normal body, right? But it's something condition or something that occurs to the tissue from the processing of it, the freezing of it, the slicing of it, the, the, the mixing of it with chemicals, the mounting it onto a slide. And as we've often talked about, when you do those things, you dehydrate the tissues. And that's the other kind of dead giveaway for these uh, uh, epididymi. When you're looking at the epididymis, it has and contains sperm and all the fluid that is supporting that sperm inside of it. But when we dehydrate this tissue during the processing, notice all the sperm tend to clump together in the center of the epididymis. Right? They're not coming out of the walls, they're all clustered together in the center of that. We see this here, we also see it here in a more high resolution, high magnification view. Again, we can nicely see the cilia, but they're just on the apical surface. There are no nuclei near the apical surface and our sperm are typically tightly clustered together. I mean, we see a teeny bit more of that occurring up here as well. So those are the things that can really help you to distinguish. Uh, and the fact that if you notice, there really aren't any interstitial cells. If there was, right, if there was, if this was the testis, we would have interstitial cells here. We have some other ductules in here, some blood vessels, right, vein, fun things along those lines in here, but we don't really see any clusters of cells like the interstitial cells that you would expect to see. So that's another way we can distinguish it as well. All right, and really, just that simply, that is the male uh, histology. We, we looked at some of this stuff already and it's pretty simple and hopefully pretty straightforward. All right, questions on any of that? All right, then onward to the female. Um, here we have an ovary. Again, uh, we can see the outer cortex and the inner medulla where we have the blood vessels and the nerves and then the cortex where we have the follicles. And as we mentioned, the anatomy of the follicles are hopefully distinctly different. The other thing you have to remember, the big key to this, is there is a difference between the 
cell, the gamete, let's say it that way. Oops. All right, there's a difference between the gamete and the follicle. So when we are talking about these, remember to be able to distinguish them. If I just ask you, now I need to point her back, what this cell is, identify this cell, be specific, what would your answer to that be? Gamete. Primary oocyte frozen in prophase one. There you go. It is a primary oocyte. You're right, it's a gamete, but that's not as specific as we can be. That indeed, all of these, every single one that we see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and parts of other ones, uh, all of these are primary oocytes that are frozen in prophase one. All right, that is the gamete, that is that specific cell. However, this cell has cells that surround it and support it. So collectively, this whole thing is called a follicle. And while the cell inside is a primary oocyte, what kind of follicle is this? Primordial follicle. It is a primordial, excellent. All of these are primordial follicles. So again, primary oocyte, but it is a primordial follicle. Single layer of flat cells wrapped around them. All right, and again, these flat cells essentially aren't doing anything, just protecting housing and storing that. It's not till they plump up to cuboidal that they start making our estrogens. Notice also we have a cluster of them together. What do we call a cluster of primordial follicles? Nest. Yeah, we got that nest there, excellent. Now remember, the beginning of the female cycle, dozens of these start the process of maturing to this state. Notice, here again is another primordial follicle. Here is a primary follicle, where we have a single layer of cuboidal cells, although you can see it's close to being on its way to moving to secondary stage. This one's got another layer of cuboidal cells, although it's not a, we don't see the nucleus in this one. This was our, only a partial section through it. But here we have an early and a late primary follicle. And of course, these primary follicles contain cells, all three. That's a cell, that's a cell, that's a cell. These three cells vary dramatically in size, but are these cells the same type of cell or different type of cells? The same. They're actually the same, absolutely. This cell in the primary, uh, in the primordial, is still that primary oocyte frozen in prophase one. So here's the one time it matches. Primary follicle, primary oocyte. However, as you can see, this one's on its way to becoming something like this. Now we have two, at least two, layers of granulosa cells around our cell. And so because it has two or more layers, it is a secondary follicle. Is this a secondary oocyte? No. Nope. Still. Primordial, primary, secondary. All of those, the egg obviously gets bigger. It is maturing, but it still has not completed meiosis one yet. So in all of these three types of follicles, we still have that primary oocyte frozen in prophase one. Notice as they also point out, uh, we can more clearly see the formation of the fecal cells here on our secondary follicle. Those are the ones, remember, that make the androgens that then our granulosa cells convert into estrogens. And notice, and again, conveniently enough, I, again, I just grabbed these pictures because I thought they were nice. I didn't care if they have labels. Obviously, the ones on the exam won't have labels. But we also see the formation of our candy-coated shell that glycogen-rich layer on the outer surface that is our zone of pellucidum. Now, at first, we just add new layers of cell around this growing oocyte, but the follicle starts to grow faster than the oocyte. So as that continues, we start to see these fluid-filled spaces that start to open up because our follicle is expanding much faster 
than our oocyte is. And these fluid-filled spaces, right, are going to eventually become what we call the antrum. This, with these pockets of spaces, but small pockets of spaces, notice they're about the same size, maybe slightly bigger than the oocyte, but they haven't fused together into one massive antrum yet. So this is still a secondary follicle. It is a late stage secondary follicle, but it's still a secondary follicle. And that also means then that this is still a primary oocyte frozen in prophase one. And like we talked about, uh, you know, 10, a dozen, get to this stage, eight, get to this stage of development. This is when they're attriting. This is when the race is on and only one of them Right? Although I would say actually, I could lie, lie. this one I would say is still secondary as well. Notice we're close. We're close to having a full continuous antrum, but notice the space is still about the same size as our uh, primary oocyte. So notice again, here we have a primary follicle, here we still have a secondary follicle, and here finally we have our tertiary follicle. Or if you like, you may call it a mature follicle, or if you like, you may call it a graphene follicle. All of those are acceptable terms. We still have our oocyte. We still have uh, um, our zona pellucida around it. However, now that we are in the tertiary follicle stage, now finally our oocyte has completed meiosis one. So now here for the first time, we have something different. Now we have a secondary oocyte frozen in metaphase two. All right. Remember also, we still have these granulosa cells, but some form a halo, or you could even say a crown-like structure around the oocyte, whereas some just form the walls of the follicle. And these special cells, again, they're only special by location. There's no difference between that cell and this cell. These cells are doing the exact same thing. The only difference is location. But these happen to be the lucky ones in the right location where they will be ovulated with the egg. And so they help to form part of the protection of the egg known as the corona radiata. Right? Because like I said, as we've all learned, corona, if you didn't know before, you know now, corona means crown. All right. And again, that big, huge fluid filled antrum. Day 14 or thereabouts, ovaltine occurs and that balloon pops. All right here we see some mature follicles and here we see what remains after ovulation. We have this big, huge collapsed follicle, the egg, its zona pellucida, its corona radiata have been expulsed but all the cells that stay behind are in the process of being transformed into that massive glandular structure that is the corpus luteum. Notice it starts about the same size as the follicle as these grow, but notice this, uh, this corpus luteum becomes a huge, massive glandular structure. Here in this ovary, we see how large and massive it becomes, and often, it will actually solidify and become a large structure. Notice here, it still kind of has that follicle shape to it, but it can actually condense down into a big, huge, massive glandular structure. Again, way back here, these are granular cells. These are, let me rephrase that. These are glandular cells, and these are glandular cells. The difference is this just produces one class of hormones, estrogens, whereas this produces two classes of hormones, right? These produce estrogens and progestins. Of course, as we know, this gets big, huge, and massive, releasing massive amounts of estrogen and progesterone, but those estrogens and progestins, they uh, inhibit the luteinizing hormone production and release. And so as, that, uh, is, as, the, as luteinizing hormone levels drop, our corpus luteum shrinks until, oh, I thought I had it. I thought I had a, uh, I thought I had a corpus albicans. Interesting, oh, well these are, there you go. Notice these structures over here, 
very clear, very white in appearance. These are some examples of some corpus albicans. It basically looks like whitish shriveled up scar tissue. It's not dark. The darkness is from the granulars that's producing from producing the hormones, from being glandular. It is no longer glandular. So we have these light, uh, clear, uh, uh, scar-like looking pieces of tissue, and that is that corpus albicans. All right. I think we did a decent job of talking about that when we did the ovarian cycle, but I'm happy to go over it again. Any questions on that? All right, as we mentioned, the egg is ovulated into the uh, peritoneal cavity, but the goal is to get it into this organ here, uh, the oviduct or the uterine tube or the fallopian tube, all appropriate names. Notice one of the big differences between the sperm and the egg is that the egg is not motile. So while the uterine tube is a relatively large structure, we don't want that egg just sitting in the center of the lumen of some big massive tube because it ha would have no way of propelling itself. So instead, as you can see, we have these massive invaginations of the mucosa and submucosa. They're almost rugae-like structures, although as far as I know, they're not called that. I don't know what they're called, actually. I don't think they have a name for them. But we have these massive invaginations of the oviduct, uh, so that pretty much no matter where the egg is in this, it will be in contact with the epithelial tissue. So it has this incredibly elaborate structure, which is very distinct and obvious. And here, we get to see what's so special about it. Here, on the surface, let's cheat and go back, along the surface, notice even at the low magnification, you can see the uniformity of the nuclei of the epithelial tissue because this is lined with a simple columnar epithelial tissue. However, here we see what's so special about it. Here we see that these simple columnar epithelial tissue have cilia. It is a ciliated simple columnar epithelial tissue. The only place you'll find it in the body. And that's so as that egg is sitting here, here the cilia can move and propel that egg along its way down the uterine tube towards the uterus. Again, it'll take about five days to run the length. And again, remember that egg only lasts for 24. So it only makes it to the uterus if it is fertilized. But um, those are the, again, so notice in the epididymis, notice in the uterine tube are the two places where we have a special tissue we haven't seen anywhere else. All right, from here, unfortunately, we move into tissue that we haven't had a chance to talk about in class yet, and that is the um, uterus. We talked a little bit about the gross anatomy. Excuse me. And we briefly mentioned the layers. We have the endometrium, uh, we have the muscularis, and we have the serosa, which is the parametrium on the outer surface there. We have not talked about the uterine cycle yet, but the uterine cycle basically has three stages. We have menses, when the functional layer of our endometrium is being expulsed. Because uh, our endometrium has two layers to it. It has a functional layer and a basal layer, or the stratum functionalis and the stratum basalis. And what happens is that um, first it is shed, then what happens is during the first uh, couple weeks of our cycle, uh, well, actually, I guess the, you know, the first five days is the menses. So after that, so the days seven through 14, the next week and change, um, six through, uh, we get a regrowing of the functional layer. And that's what we're seeing here. This is what is known as the proliferative phase, where we are proliferating new cells and replacing that layer that has been lost. However, and estrogen primarily uh, stimulates this regrowth. But then remember one of the things we said is that those progestins that are released by the corpus luteum is that warning bell that tells the uterus to get ready for implantation. 
at which point we get a massive growth, a massive glandularization, and a massive vascularization of our functional layer. Here we see that secretory uh, uh, stage where we have this massive glandularization. Notice we have these big, huge, massive coiled tubes. We can see a little of those coiled tubes here in the proliferative or pre-ovulatory phase. Here, post-ovulatory though, you see massive glandularization, massive vascularization, massive growth of this functional layer in anticipation of implantation. However, this can only be maintained with those progestin layers. So when the progestin goes away, this layer can't be maintained. And so it is this functional layer that is shed during menses and the cycle continues again. Again, I look, you, these views show this great big, huge coiled uh, uterine glands that are produced. These are what are gonna produce the uterine milk, again, with the goal of sustaining uh, that uh, egg. As I mentioned, it takes the egg about five days to reach the uterus. The, it will then actually stay in the uterus for another two to three days before it finally implants in the uterine wall. And so the uterine secretions that are produced by here are going to help to maintain that uh, developing egg as it works its way and eventually embeds itself in the uterine wall. All right, and there you go. Just that simply, we have hit all of the histology you are responsible for. All right, questions on any of that? Like I said, we'll talk more about the function of the uterus wall uh, when we actually get to that on Monday's lecture. And then, come on, what are you doing? There we go. On Monday's lecture, we'll do that. And then, uh, uh, then depending on how long, we gotta finish off the rest of the female reproductive track. Uh, female physiology, we've done some of, we need to talk about arousal and orgasm in females as well. And then um, from there, depending on how much time's left, we'll see how much of the uh, development and hereditary stuff we can get into. I don't want to cram too much stuff in because you guys have a test two days later. Uh, but uh, there, and again, literally, literally there are entire semester long classes on development and inheritance. Obviously, that's not something that we can shoehorn into, you know, an hour of time, but but we'll talk a little bit about stuff. Maybe we'll talk about the point of fertilization or something along those lines. We'll see, we'll see where we're at time-wise and how we feel from there. All righty. You guys have been awful quiet. Any questions on any of that? Uh, I certainly encourage you to color and label the histology because, again, that's going to be what helps you to be successful. Uh, if you want me to make it an assignment, I could, but the problem is the people who aren't here won't know about it, and I'd prefer to not have it due on the day of the exam, so I don't want to have to mention it on Wednesday. So what I would do is I would encourage you to do that because it's going to help you to be successful. Uh, my guess is that histology will be, I don't know, 25%, a third of the uh, – a third, maybe a third. You could think of it maybe, yeah, I'd say probably a third male, a third female, and then a third histology. That seems like a uh, a reasonable breakdown of what the, the lab exam might look like. So I could see that being the case. So yeah, do it because it'll help you to be successful. But I'm not going to assign it. All righty. Any other questions? All right. Well, then in that case, have a good day. I will see you guys Monday for our last lecture. Uh, this, uh, In some ways, this semester feels like it's gone by so super slow. In others, it feels like it is just raced by. But either way, it's been memorable. And so uh, um, let me go ahead and